What's going on, everybody? My name is Danny Ferrari. My name is Parker Immense. My name. Oh, I should have told you. So my name's Electric. 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 Oh yeah. Did I say it wrong? <laughs> Electric. It's electric. Like, you electric. said it wrong. Electric, electric, electric. It doesn't Th thick really trick. matter. So it's too much. thick trick. Thick boy. Thick trick. What's going on, everybody? My name is Danny Ferrari. My name is Parker Ament. My name is Electric. And we are here with a very, very special. Oh, we, I was supposed to say we were excellent. You do the intro. Fuck. Me. We're going to be going over a bunch of really, really cool stuff. We finally got him in the studio. Yep. We're going to be getting techie. Yeah, we're going to get real to professor shit. Oh, yes. This is Professor Electric right here. We're going to talk about how to actually make your mixes better. Uh, this guy is an insane producer and an insane uh, engineer, so we're really excited to have him here in the studio. So make sure you guys click the like button, comment down below, and subscribe if you're new here. Let's get in the video. I'm new Let's here. Let's jump in. You're new. Yes, you are new. This is the first FL Studio video on the channel. Yeah. Which is pretty insane, and I'm so stoked to do it with you. Yeah, Air bro. Horn, Air horn. Yeah. yeah. We met at EDC, and we had a great We became a rave family immediately. Oh, yeah. It was immediate. You were my first rave family. Yeah. You are my first rave bay. Yeah. Rave bay? Is that what they're called? <laughs> I was really upset that you didn't give me candy, though. Because I, I never got. Have, he didn't have any candy. I, didn't have any candy, I don't know. No. It's my first rave. You've been to a rave. You should. You should have brought candy for new people. It's <laughs> for very rude of you. Yeah. <laughs> should have brought new candy. Kids. <laughs> that sounds. Like yeah. Do you do the whole uh, like weird. the whole this? Yeah. The docking of no, hands. You do the docking. <laughs> I just want to say it's awesome here, and thanks for having me. It's absolutely real cozy. Bro. I love yeah, this place. Dude. Yeah, awesome, bro. Man. We're excited to do much more. So let's jump in the video. Let's jump right in. Are you using span in the sense of separation? Like, are you mm. are you using yeah. it as a reference point from somebody else's song? Like, will you show us how you kind of mm. use it in that sense? Yeah. Uh, no, I'm not using reference songs. I'm just looking. I'm so basically everything is always gonna sound more compatible, like compatibility with other sound systems if you make a flat mix, right? Because right. The, the spectral profile is literally fucking equal, like the same amount of bass as mids as highs and everything. Mm -hmm. That means that any sound system you play it on, depending on the profile of that sound system, headphones, whatever, the chances of it still sounding good are going to be much higher than when it's mixed for a specific tone. Like if it's really bright, if you listen on like phone speakers, it's just going to sound like right. the entire time. Yeah. Whereas if you mix it super bassy, when you play it on a bassy sound system with not enough tweeters, it's gonna sound just basically like you have no highs. Right. So if you have a flat mix, that still translates decently to to those systems. Interesting. That is funny. When you think about the word flat, like it's I, I know what it means, but then like to think about it visually like that, like literally a flat response yeah. over the entire frequency yeah. spectrum. Yeah. Well, because of like separation between low end and mids and highs, you generally do want the low mid dip a mm -hmm. little bit you don't want like it to be completely flat because it'll i mean it'll still sound good but it, it might already feel a little busier if there's like literally no separation here in the low mids yeah the mud so yeah exactly so you can be really fucking surgical with this because and i've noticed especially people that are working on ableton and they're looking at like the eq3 or whatever um visualizer mm -hmm. on it it's so deceiving it's like yeah. that thing doesn't tell me anything yeah and then when i open up span it's like holy shit there's like a whole bunch of low end that i wasn't seeing before it's like it's just there and then you, you distort or you compress and that stuff is phasing with everything so this is just like the, to me it's just the truth it, it helps me understand what's That's really so going on there's and just lies is it mainly like because i know there's a free version you have the paid version mm. yeah it's the same thing it's the same you thing. You do not need Spam Plus. Don't get Spam Plus. The, the extra features are useless. I've never used them. But it feels good having it, though, I bet. Because <laughs> <It just laughs> you're, like, you're like a, slightly you're, more. You're a Span <laughs> fan. <laughs> you're a Stan, Span, Span, you're Stan. Span Stan. <laughs> so the first thing I do is identify the fundamental. And obviously in the intro where there's no, no bass, that's not, you're not going to be able to do that. You want to do. You want to kind of calibrate this on the drop section, right? So we play. <laughs> Let's, let's freeze it for a second here. And now, do keep in mind, this is not a final mix. It's still a work in progress. Mm -hmm. It's playable, whatever. And it's still rather dynamic. You'll see certain frequencies going, going up and down a lot. But the point that I'm trying to make here is identify the fundamental and note the relationship between the volume of the fundamental and the overtones. If you notice that there's a massive hole here above the first harmonic, the W, it's going to sound like there's not a lot of low mids. There's just like no 
overtones that are making it feel like the bass is full. Right. Whenever you hear one of those like trap tracks, it's a fucking bass sounds insane. What's happening is there's a lot of overtones on the bass. It's never just a single fundamental and then just nothing. Yeah, we usually draw in the the harmonics on mm-hmm. like a sine wave mm-hmm. a lot of times with serum and stuff. So the volume relationship, you just want the overtones to be slightly below the fundamental is in volume wise. Mm-hmm. I, I'm looking for like a slightly downward like downward trend like this, like a little. Oh, uh, okay. Interesting. Go, that goes down. And then depending on the style of song, you, you're going to want to cut that earlier. You, can see you might have a low mid bass. Anyway, you're trying to not have overlap. This bass is the entire spectrum. It's just like right. super distorted. It's like the whole thing is this one sound. But typically when dubstep, that's not the case. You'll have a, a different low end element, and then you just want to make sure that you assign it with an overtone if you don't have good clean with clean i mean so you can divide elements into either tonal or noise Mm -hmm. and especially for low-end information you're looking for something that's tonal right because it'll be more defined and it'll feel fuller than if it's just like rumbly i mean when something is phasing it starts to lean more towards the noise because it's not as consistent the signal starts to like flutter like mm-hmm. so if you can keep things clean and tonal especially in the low end it'll feel much more prominent and it'll like it fills the mix better so when you're talking about the the relationship between the fundamental frequency of mm-hmm. the sub right now mm-hmm. and the second but the first overtone or the, the first oh harmonic. yeah so that to me look i mean what's the db it's is it six six db lower mm-hmm. in this screenshot yeah is that the range you're looking for or are you saying like because no specific range but note that this specific bass that we're looking at is quite dynamic and that's probably going to change when i once i do like oh, i'm going to do like the final mix i probably want to like do some dynamic eqing right. there to make it to like tuck it in prevent it from going up and down quite as much you notice oh, that it's going up and down, yeah, right? It's yeah. not staying there. Right. So it's because a re-space mm-hmm. is, f- is already really hard to control because mm-hmm. it's literally going in and out of phase. But notice that the amount of dynamics here is not crazy. Yeah. And they're always kind of sitting in that same sort of movement. So this frame that I'm pulling up right now is a really good reference. Like, right. see, we have the, the bottom here going down. Now, again, this, very close this, too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So this kind of represents the low mid pocket a little bit. Again, this sound, it's not the best example because usually you, you want some separation between your sub element and your, your right. body okay. mid the element, right? So you like roll that off here. If but you in this case, layer. the bass is the entire sound. Right. That's why it feels so fucking massive. And then typically, especially for like more aggressive and like maximal styles like dubstep and shit, you want a li- you want some like more excitement here in the highs. But note that this is just the bass. Right. So I still have hats and shit that are going on top here. So I'm keeping a little bit of space now. So I'm rolling this off so that there's headroom available for my hi-hats. Right. And the way that I do that is by first soloing my hi-hats and seeing where are they sitting. Okay, they're sitting here around 10K typically or maybe they're sitting at 15k in which case i want to like pull down a little bit of space there pull down some eq volume on my base to keep space for the hats but aside from spectral separation you can also do mid-side separation so you don't want everything to be stereo you don't want everything to be mono just the same way that you wouldn't pan everything left right so essentially what you're doing is you're looking which parts of the spectrum are mono heavy and which parts are side heavy so this pink curve here i set it to pink is the um, the underlay which is the side information here uh, this, very very little in this right, case yeah. it's like it's pretty much entirely mono because i have another layer that is super wide See, this, uh, this guy oh that's doing, the pink on top of it yeah. right there oh wow so, yeah that's very wide yeah so note here when it gets brighter that signifies that those frequencies are actually louder on the side than they are on the mono. Right. So the phase difference is greater than the phase coherence in, in mono. So if you want it to be mono compatible, typically you want to stay on the side where it's not turning bright. Because as soon as it gets louder on the side than it is on the mono, when you play it on a mono system, which you know most venues will do, right. they'll just turn your entire fucking master to mono because it's not realistic for them to play a left right signal you know depending on where you are in the venue you're right. gonna get a completely different uh, representation and also it would 
create a lot more phasing problems. That's a really good point that a lot of people forget about. It exists. There's venues that do, but I mean, I imagine. But so do you br- do you does. have different do you have different bounces for what you're going to play out versus what you release? No, I just always make sure it's mono compatible. Just that. That's like, the main yeah, thing. it can be really fucking wide, mm-hmm. but as long as it sounds mono compatible, and this is a good way to assure that, you know, making sure that it doesn't that it's excessively stereo, right? Especially in the body of the mix. Like the highs, if it's ear candy, nobody cares. Right. Fucking, okay. Except for ooh, us. I can't hear that white noise <laughs> yeah. as loud on my right. mono mix. It's fine. Like, just make it wide, but obviously make sure that it still sounds cohesive and stereo. It's not like super wide and then like yeah. overpowering because when you're listening on headphones or somebody's listening on like AirPods or whatever, you're going to get that stereo mix and it still needs to sound good, but the mono mix is more important. Right. Also, it's important to note that whenever something is in mono, not twice as loud but it's the loudness potential is greater because the signal is the same left and right when it's stereo there's a difference between the left and right signal and that makes the volume potential smaller right yeah so, it's stacking yeah exactly you're stacking th- those sine waves in mono literally the, the exact same ones i noticed too like in this session when we were listening to the drums specifically mm. the clap was it felt like the clap was on the left and the right side of my ears. Like there was a lot of stereoness. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but no, that's no, what it sounded like. It's definitely like. pretty wide. Can you, here. yeah, can you show us? So no, it's here. So, like I've never, I mean, I pan, I pan my drums and stuff, but it felt like I had two claps on both sides of my ears and it was really nice. There's a snare here and then there's a clap on top as well. So this one is like, it's fairly, fairly wide, you see? This, this. Right. So the way that you can always make sure that it sounds fine in mono is by literally just playing it in mono. Well, let me just take this version. It's a little more pleasant. And then we can just make it mono here on the mixer in FL. You have a mid-side separation. Like oh, that's wider cool. or completely mono. And that's just default? Yeah, that's, that's plus on one. the mixer. That's default. Well, you got to click this sick. little extra volume properties thingy. To, oh, to wow. Those. The thing is, it's, it's, it's post effects. So it's not going to show on the visualizer. Okay. Unless you like put it in the chain here. Oh, that was, yeah. I can do um, stereo shaper. So the stereo shaper is really cool. So because aside from just literally making something mid or side, you can do all these cool things. Like you, you can listen to exclusively your side signal. It's like utility. Kind yeah. of, but this this seems like it has more features. And then you can also route the side signal, so everything that's side now becomes mono. Whoa, that's a good mono maker. Yeah, yeah. that is really sick. Um, but we were lo- trying to look at just mid, so here. So sounds fine in mono. Right. So anytime you're using any kind of like stereo enhancers or stereo tricks, you know, like Haas effects, things like that, you always want to make sure that you check what it's doing and especially Haas effect is going to do some crazy tone shifting yeah. comb filtering to your sound so you want to be really careful with that always check in mono if you're not sure what it's doing but again comb filtering really easy to spot that on side of inside of span you, you would see like these little dips that are right. going, like the, the comb shape yeah like it looks like in serum yeah so you know, I see the body the bottom is really tight in mono in the mids not nearly as I could still remove some of this stuff, like from some rumbly shit here on the snare, I think. Um, but that's what I'll do, like on the final mix, essentially. So when I ask you about the separation, it sounds like what you're telling telling me or telling mm. us is like the biggest thing seems to be about how you control your mid and side, besides just normal EQ stuff. Well, spectral separation is more important than anything. Yeah, of course, because if something is overlapping spectrally, they're going to phase, and it's going to be impossible to fix that with making one mono on the other side it helps but it's not going to completely fix it right yeah if, if the highs are too busy you can make some stuff mono and some stuff side but it's not going to completely fix that there's still overlap there if especially if both are really loud yeah so assigning stereo separation or stereo width to the individual layers as if you're panning things. Like you're not gonna put everything in the middle, you wanna put something left, something right. You wanna make some things mono, something a little wider, and then some things a lot wider. Mm. So imagine that also as like a, a percent, like an amount, yeah. You wanna like- what are, what are some tools that you use to widen. kind of play with, yeah, with widening or even monoing? Um, well, monoing, I just usually use a stereo shaper or that mid-side separation yeah, right on there. the mixer. But when it comes to widening, I use side widener from JST quite a bit because I like that it has like, several options for widening it's not just like different oh that's cool why is it so tiny that's like a it's a metal plugin yeah it is yeah so mode one doesn't use uh, any sort of time difference between left and right so it's really tight 
great for percussion. Oh, nice. Anything really. Tone is essentially um, whether or not you're also widening the low end or not. So I, I don't think I think turning it to zero turns it off completely. Or it's the other way around. Wait, we can check that real easily. Yeah. Pop it on the master. Pop some JST on the master. And then open up span. And I'll pop that up. Yeah, ah. turning it up definitely yeah. widens the low end a lot more. Which is not what we want. <laughs> so definitely never do this on the master. Right. Okay, you want to assign width to elements specifically. That's why I, I don't like when people are using the imager on the master either. Like it can help if, and it also the range, the amount of widening that it can do is not crazy, but it, it can help if like the relationship between the individual elements is already good. Like some things are mono, some things are stereo, and you just want to bump up the width of the already white things. In that case, yes. But if you're trying to like really make the entire mix like more contrasted, it's not the move because you want to assign it individually for each of the layers. So there's more You want contrast. it already there before it hits the master. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also never, ever, ever use the... Um, stereo wise feature because it's the same thing as using the widener on the entire master like things that are mono will become stereo mm -hmm. so then you have nothing completely centered anymore which right. reduces the contrast because nothing is in the middle um, so yeah this feature you can use it on, on elements by themselves but don't do that on the master hmm. it just takes away from the the meat of the mono yeah exactly but will you mid-side eq meat. Huh? Will you mid-side EQ on your master? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, often, not always, I'll do a little cut Yeah, here. just like the simple. The, the side yeah. cut, yeah, and figure out up to what point I, I want it, I like it. Mm. I just want to make sure that the base is sitting nice and centered. That gives me like a different dimension for where that is sitting. It's like mm -hmm. nice and, and tight in the middle, and then everything else. Some mixes, they need like really crazy wide low mids. Mm -hmm. It just helps them feel bigger it, it, it really depends on where everything is sitting because if your top end is sitting more mono like more centered your hats and things like that then you might want to have a really wide mid mix you know right. again for contrast because if the the mids are wide and the highs are wide it's again not going to be as quite as contrasted so, so you're really not trying to where. change if you brought in a hi-hat sample right mm -hmm. and you're saying hey this hi-hat sample tends to sit a little bit more mono right and let's say most of your drums are essentially a little bit more in the mono range mm -hmm. you're not going to try to get those to be stereo you're going to let I mean, them be what they are yeah, and i might want to depends on what's happening in the in the synth realm but if you're if your mids was to actually already have that stereo spread then you're like okay that's fine again it depends on what the song needs okay yeah like so, this song especially because it's like a crazy reese bass i think it might sound better by having wide mids right because it makes like it feels like there's a lot of movement in the headphones but let's say I want to I want to flip it, right? right. I want to go, and this guy is now gonna be a wide mid mix, a wide, mid -mix, which sounds really cool. I think like uh, a lot of neuro producers and drum and bass producers, they they like to have like a lot of movement and width in yeah. that in those low mids. But let's see exactly how wide, because I don't want to push it too far. It's already too much. Yeah. But I can address this specific problem here, so I can like, I don't need a fuckload of, of width, uh, I just need, and then I can pull down, yeah, <laughs> yes, was, dude, was, was, there's the like, Reese, baby, <laughs> there's the Reese. I'm gonna keep this open, hold up, I'll detach it, oh, it's already detached. Yeah, I'm like tucking this back down, yeah. so it stays compatible. And then maybe make the mod. And then bring this stuff up. Oh, get, get rid of that. I can't. So now we're making those low mids. Except for right here at 597. It's too white there. How are you? This is, huh? Oh, you're just looking at the volume. Yeah, that's so huge. See, like when it peaks out? That's mm -hmm. where I'm pulling it back down a little bit. I'm just only dealing with side information right now. But we were trying to keep better. the top end. <laughs> but now we have we have a clashing element because now this element is also wide. Ah, uh, yeah. It's this guy here. Solo that. So now this one, instead I'm gonna put it more towards the middle. See how, how wide it is. See now this one is sitting more in the middle. 
Yeah, very mono. I can have a little bit, but not a lot. Yeah. So this one's sitting in the middle. Again, because they're not sitting in the same sort of stereo width, they're gonna be more separated on a stereo mix, of course. Right, okay. Not gonna affect the mono mix. Do you ever use it on individual tracks? Yeah. yeah everything's going through the master, why would I? Are you doing it after the master processing, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. At so the at the final, very end of your chain. Right at the end. Really, the really cool. And the uh, for some people that are seeing this, the P controller is just for my elf. Where is she? She's hiding. Your elf? Yeah. Is this an F elf? Is that thing? like a F elf? F elf. Dance it's move. Aesthetics. Oh, it's aesthetics. What it's is stuff. that, dude? There we go. Oh, there she is. Oh, cool. Depending on the volume, she does a different dance because I, I mapped it so that the peak so value sick. of the audio And that's stock with FL? The, yeah. That's plus one. Look at her go. This is not doing anything to the audio. Okay. That was the point. Okay. And then this patcher is all of my visual, my other visualizers, like Wave Candy here, which is only showing the mono spectrum. If yeah. I, you want to talk about why you use that? Yeah. So that's showing the frequency spectrum in a lot more detail. It's like a heat map, essentially. So mm -hmm. Wave Candy, uh, sorry, Span can do most of the things that you need because it shows mono and stereo. But if you want to look at specific phasing issues, like this won't really show when something is phasing. <laughs> Like if there's overlap there, you'll just see a bunch of like curves, right? But when, when you look closely at Wave Candy, you see the, the lines, right? Mm -hmm. So note here already, note that the line here in the beginning is really clean, right? It's like very non-squiggly. Mm -hmm. And then you have a down lifting sine wave here that comes in. And it starts to get close to this one. And then look at what happens here. It goes up and down mm -hmm. yeah that signifies phasing that Aww. means that this sine wave is being modulated by the other sine wave that's interfering with it now if i were to s mute this one this would once would stay clean and flat so whenever you're designing something or when you're doing you know sound design or you're mixing you can actually see when things are phasing so it helps mm. to like spot things obviously that's really awesome what it sounds like is more important, but this gives you just a lot more in-depth control. Like if I hover my mouse over, I can see exactly which frequency that is also. That's crazy. Yeah. That's so, so dope. So um, for people that are not familiar with heat maps, brighter or more yellow is louder. Right. Colder, like more blue is quieter. So you see here the bit crush effect. Um, also what is really fucking cool is the more you use this thing, <laughs> The more you get like a visual library of what certain effects look like. Oh, so, that's really cool. Yeah, so and you can see filter movement and things like that. So if you're trying to like remake something, mm -hmm. you see, oh, there's a fucking dip that goes from this frequency to that frequency. What effect could that be? Is it literally just a filter automation or is it something else? So for example, here we're seeing like the movement of the res bass. You see like the in and out mm -hmm. of the volume there. And it's like going faster. I mean, it's, it's a little harder on this one because it's very dense and there's a lot of overlap. But if you were to solo things, it would be easier. Uh, the more it's compressed, the more things get kind of like pushed right. together. But yeah, you can very clearly see like the transients here of the little. Ah, uh, interesting. Yeah. And another thing is if you can't see it, you probably can't hear it ah, unless oh. it's unless it's side like again it's showing just mono information but through the stereo sh shaper we could reroute the side information to be mono anyway i i usually only use it for that reason but it's it's really helpful for me if i'm like showing students like hey you have a problem in your mix and it, i can't see that transient or like right. i'm like trying to figure out why your snare doesn't cut through the mix and like oh fucking can't see it from this frequency to that frequency it's just like a hole there mm -hmm. and it really translates to exactly what you're hearing that's really cool it kind of validates what you're telling the student yeah, because yeah. they it's can't very easy to illustrate right. what yeah. the problem is Exactly, because they might not have ear training and like not be able to spot. I mean, if you don't have this exactly, I could tell you like there's a problem between like 500 and 1K, and it's like find find where it is. <laughs> right. Yeah. Whereas here, I mean, like, literally, it's fucking 307. It's like boom. Boom. That's what is that? You don't want that there. Oh my god. So okay, I think it's important too to like to state this, but 
you obviously have some phasing going on in your track, okay? We're mm-hmm. obviously seeing it right now, okay? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, it's a it's a Reese base. Yeah, it's a Reese That's base, yeah. right? If there so, wasn't phasing, it wouldn't be a Reese base. I think it's important for people to know that, like, I feel like if if I was like a newer producer, and it's like the idea of like I thought I had to put a compressor on everything when I first started, and like the word phase that is you don't? like. Yeah, you don't. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And the, just the word phase is like a bad word. Like if yeah. you have phase, it's, it's scary. bad. And, but yeah, it's yeah, like it's, that's context, not context. Yeah, yeah. it's if some phase is okay. Like we have phase. There's phasers. You know what I mean? A, a comb filter is a mm. lot of weird phasing. You know, hyper dimension. Yeah, you need to understand like, where that difference is, and a lot of that is the experience, but also just yeah, knowing that phasing is only bad when you don't want it to phase. Right. When you exactly. want it to phase, it's, it's desired. Yeah, so it's just interesting. I just just imagine somebody watching this video that's like a little bit newer, and they're like, "Oh, okay, sick." And then they just Avoid go through, and they're just, <laughs> it's just like, yeah. it would sound like, so. I did what he said, <laughs> dude. I think it's so cool that you identified what things look like. Like, when, yeah, I like what, that a lot. What phasing actually looks like. So then, whenever you see it, if it's not a mm-hmm. respace, if it's like a clean pop track or something yeah. cool, yeah, and you're like, you oh, there it, it is. It's right. like. That's really cool, man. For example, if we're dealing with like clean, simple sine waves here, this is this is phasing, right? So if it wouldn't phase if it were on the same frequency like this. Now I'm right. introducing a second sine wave. They're currently perfectly in phase, so they're clean. But as soon as I start to detune one, you notice it going in and out of phase. See, it gets quiet. It's LFO. Yep. That's literally yeah that's just it's not a volume automation it's just the sine wave going in and out of phase right the, the same sine wave the more out of tune or the more you detune it the faster that that occurs of course and then if you play a saw wave and you detune it that same yeah. thing happens but at different speeds for each of the individual oh so like waves. can you do that again freeze it oh freeze okay <laughs> This little like cool little star pattern is that yeah. the phase right there that we're we're seeing like with the, if you yeah, saw that would it be it's like a pattern that starts to occur as a result of the phase relationship between the individual harmonics. Now whether or not it's actually doing that star pattern or not is maybe it's some, kind like, of an visual illusion. artifact. Yeah, it could be. But you can see also see like these yeah. frequencies are definitely lower, like attenuated. I just got right. such a great idea for you, Vince. Mm. If you made like a folder of all of the problem images, mm. in avoid this. Yes, avoid these don't images. Do yeah, yeah, don't do this. And like this is phasing right here, and then you, that's the identification for phasing, or like yeah. that could be really cool. You know, it's like this a little is, workbook. This is intimidating to look at for it is. like for newer producers. Yeah, like when yeah. I'm looking at, it, I'm like, I have a lot no of idea time when I'm doing that. streams. I'm like, there are people are like, what, what am I looking for? Yeah, right. But again, kind of push yourself to just use it. Like put it on there and leave it. Learn it, and, yeah. And, and l- see what things look like. Also, definitely put in other people's tracks in the beginning and to get mm-hmm. an idea of what it's supposed to look like. What what does a good song look like? And that's exactly how I learned it. You know, yeah. I was doing the Kenny Ball and Radio podcast for years and I was having that on there. And I was like, oh, okay, that's how, that's why it sounds so fucking cool. And you got to be flexible with that, okay? Like different genres, they provide different sort of patterns right. and, and different sort of like aesthetic. Some tracks are really fucking dirty and still sound good, mm-hmm. but that's kind of personal taste. Right. You know, the like fucking metal rhythm, death court. Mm-hmm. It's going to be fucking crunchy, but right. you'll still see your transients are cutting through that. Right. Like, You'll see them. Right? You're so see that's the blast it. beats. Mm-hmm. And this is a so this is a stock plugin yeah, with FL. NFL, wave candy. Yeah. So if we're not in FL, let's say you're in Ableton or something, <laughs> it'd be so crazy if you yeah, were. Fuck. Yeah, you fucked. Yeah, fucked. <laughs> yeah, you got nothing. I mean, you, you got still, RX8, which is still, nine hundred dollars. We just have span, right? Span. And span is all you need. This but I want to see the, the heat I know, map. I, I want see. thermal imaging. So I know that well, Isotope. You could rewire FL Studio into Ableton and just run it just through the master and have it on there. Yeah. How does this one compare to like the Isotope readout? Like the this is way more detailed. The green one, because you know the green one where it where. You mean, uh, are you talking about insight? Uh yeah, insight. Yeah. Spectrogram. Oh yeah. And then I think you could change the colors or something. That's all. But yeah, you're right. Look at that. It's not oh, very. So you can't freeze it, can you? Yeah. Front I guess front. you would have to do like RX. Yeah. Right, but, and I don't think yeah. you could do that really live as a plugin. It's so plug-in. annoying. It's, you have to yeah, render it's, it's, it and shit. It's a lot like RX. Yeah. Actually, it's still better than RX. Wow. Like the definition of this individual line. When you I hear that, up. Isotope? 
Mm-hmm. Sorry. Mm-hmm. If maybe if they were sponsored, I wouldn't say this. Yeah. <laughs> They'd probably say like, we really is, like This is hinted. a base inside of a Oh, yeah, look. There it is. Like you already have it open. Blurring together. Like, you can't really tell where that – it's like a little too – Interesting. The resolution is lacking. I remember when I first started producing, one of the biggest things that I was the most jealous of that FL had that Ableton didn't, or that I think I was in Logic actually, yeah. was their Spectrum on their EQ. And I remember watching like oh, a Martin Logic. Garrick. No, 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 in so, FL. This oh, is as FL. close as, as I think we'll get. Unless there's like a, a sort of way to sharpen or improve the resolution, they're looking like such thick ass blobs. Whereas in here, there's yeah, like, yeah they're crisp, they're blurry. But this is also largely to do with the settings here. Like, t- if I change the bands to something else than that, it starts to uh, blur out a little bit. Wow. That's not real. These are it's like a, some, sh- some bullshit in between there, whereas on 2048, it's like spaghetti. It feels like it's optimal. Also, when you don't have enhanced frequency on, which, why? <laughs> oh, yeah. then it looks like RX. Like, pretty much, yeah. Wow. Maybe if you crank it up and then turn off. And then... Yeah, that's pretty much what RX looks yeah. like. Yeah. So it's just the enhanced frequency, man. They. What happens if you this. put it on? Why don't you put it on eight thousand then? I showed you. It looks. It looks like spaghetti. Oh, it's too good. much. So that's you just twenty forty eight. Yeah, it's to artifacts. <laughs> Take the stuff in that between. That looks good. Them. Yeah. Yeah. See, it's just not. I mean, you could, but it, also here in the high mids. Like, oh, it starts washy. to get blurred. Yeah, see? That just means it looks cool. <laughs> yeah. 2048 is a right. magic number in, in this, apparently. That makes sense. That's really, yeah. really cool. Cool, dude. So we're fucked. We'll never be good at mixing because we don't have <laughs> FL. Yeah, we don't have wave candy, dude. We have, we have candy. to wait till Halloween Span and uh, knock on FL's door. Aside from trying to flatten out your spectral profile on their master, it's okay if things are peeking out above your sub. It's mm-hmm. not like, oh my god, it was it just passed my fucking sub. I'm gonna c- cut that. No, 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 no. You can have dynamics, but you're looking for trends. Mm-hmm. So when something is consistently trending past your base, pretty good chance it's gonna sound like it's overpowering it. But if something is just like whoop going above, or it's like a, an element that just appears and then leaves again, it's okay. You just wanna keep an, an ear out for you know when it sounds like it's too much. And if you do feel like certain elements are overpowering a little bit, definitely have a look at why and compare it to the volume of your fundamental. So what, what are you trying to hit as far as how loud, like as your reference? So, this so is, I don't do loudness in here. So you just I, want not, everything to be very flat, flat yeah, and consistent. Yeah. And, and, You're and not really peaking above, but overall trending flat. So this is a little warm of a mix. And that's why it's also not a final mix. Yeah. Probably end up brightening this, brightening this a little bit more on the percussive side to fill out these top ends. And there's, there's, you can see here also on wave candy, there's not a lot happening up there. Yeah. A little bass heavy, but you know some tracks sound better like that. Yeah. And contextually, you have to you know understand that nothing is absolute in this case. Yeah. But it is a really really good reference. So again, we're looking at a pretty flat representation here. If you feel like your track is lacking like loudness and presence, a lot of the time it'll be the mids that are just not quite loud enough. So I could pull all of this up in this specific point in in the track here, yeah. this specific frame, and it would actually just make it louder and and can't necessarily say better because better is very like subjective. Right. Yeah. But it would make it more present and aggressive. Think like the bass here is sitting a little higher, the highs are sitting a little higher, so there's a bit of a dip here. We could fill that out with EQ or with saturation if it's not already too crazy and busy there. Yeah, you want to just keep things a little dynamic. It's okay if it peaks past it, but just make sure that the overall trend is looking rather flat or that you at least are aware that the highs are sticking out a little bit, but it's a conscious decision. Yeah. I'm I'm super excited to try this out. Yeah, like, I'm excited. Especially when I'm producing. Even in the producer stage, like when I am choosing what sounds I want, maybe I want certain drums and see how they look, you know? Yeah, how much side information they have, how much money information they have. Yeah, so I'm I'm very excited to do that. I think it's funny too because it's like it's really easy to take this and then start like 
using your eyes to mix, but the reality is, is like it's first how it sounds, and then you use this to find any problems to make it sound better. Essentially, yeah. mm -hmm. I think that's really important to say too. Yeah, yeah, I showed this to a lot of my friends and and Frank that was on the podcast a while ago. Yeah, uh, ranks. Mm -hmm. He also is like, dude, it's like fucking changed everything because it makes it so much easier. You don't have to ask yourself why does it sound right. weird. It's like, oh, fucking right there, it's, see it. There's the answer. Whoop, fix it. Yeah, exactly. Is it maybe too wide? Is it maybe not um, present enough in the high mids? And also, I wanted to show the settings real quick yeah. so that people can copy these. It's not uh, a preset that's already in there, but I do mid-side stereo first, and then you have a toggle here between what you're looking at, mid versus side. On the mid-side, I have fill display on. I turn on 8,192 uh, or a little higher, depending on what your CP GPU can handle. And then on, I do the exact same settings, except I turn off fill display for the side one. And then you got to turn on underlay and hit side. Can you save that as a preset? Yeah, and then you can go in here. Well, in FL, you can do save as preset there, or you can go in here. And uh, so these are the banks. These are the presets here. So check the save there. Can and wait, Yeah, let's give it away. Yeah, can we save it and give it yeah. away to people as a free totally. download for this yeah. video? Fuck yeah, let's do it. And we'll put the link in the description for Span as well so people can download it because it's free and then they can just yeah, use uh, this. If you don't like the colors that you, I've chosen, too bad. then you don't have good taste. Yeah, yeah it's too bad. <laughs> too bad. <laughs> Deal with default. it. If you don't like vaporwave <laughs> raves. Yeah. yeah, I went purple pink. Yeah. That's yeah. what it's all about. If you want the background to be black, that's over here. Colors Dark mode. Black. Yeah, black. That's really sick. Yeah, I don't like the other way span, the, the green and... Oh, yeah, yeah. no. So, no like, way. Noob. Yeah. <laughs> so noob. You just got this, didn't yeah. you? That's Fit. how mine is. <laughs> <laughs> mine too. Hi, I'm mine here too. to learn. <laughs> so loudness is not measured in here. Loudness is measured in a LUFS meter, such as Pro-L. It's not a meter per se. It's a limiter, but it shows LUFS, especially if you have it set up here in a way that you can... I mean, it's the white line. So the white line here is giving the LUFS value. We're sitting, we're hugging that minus four here on the louder sections, which is for EDM, dubstepy shit, it's, it's great. You're doing a good job. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, very nice. Yeah, that's the ballpark that I was aiming for. I play the song mm -hmm. at first. I work with several stages of compression, including um, on the buses, on the channels themselves, and on the master, just to get it to that point. And then once I've achieved that desired calibration loudness point, then I will go back to my span and I will monitor my spectral my spectral like curve. Got it. If I notice that there's things sticking out, such as my sub here a little bit, and I feel like uh, the track could be a little bit louder, I bring down that sub a little bit to flatten it out. Obviously, I, like I mentioned earlier, it's better to have the sub just a tiny bit above the first overtones. But this, for example, could be higher. By pulling this down, I know my LUFS will go back down. So then I can compensate by pushing a little higher in the limiter again. Mm -hmm. And then that should get me back to that calibration point in, in volume. And it will also make it perceivably louder because we're more sensitive to the mids and highs. You know, right. The 1 to 5K range mostly. So if I also just want to make the track louder and more aggressive, if I notice that I still have space available here, I'll just bump it up between 1 and 5K. Just an EQ bump? Yeah, uh, on the master. Just go a little scoop. Like that, or maybe booper. I'll compress it instead of just doing an EQ bump. Like a dynamic. Uh, yeah. yeah, a dynamic EQ. Uh, that's basically what I'm doing here. I noticed it's like, it a little too warm, so I'll just add a 2 dB there. And then the sub, I wanted it louder, but I also wanted it more stable, so I compressed right. this. But it's probably a little too much. Anyway. Do the dynamic? Bump. Yeah. Yeah, do a dynamic so that when this pulls up too much, it gets pulled back down. But when it's quiet, it gets pulled up. Love that. It's crazy how much just an analyzer can do for you as a yeah. producer. If you're referencing another sound and you're trying to remake it, like you had mentioned too. And just like just being able to see what's going yeah. on. Exactly. Like if you look at this. Uh, <laughs> like that, the little up and down there, they're like. Like you can see here, oh, there's some like volume movement happening there. But oh, obviously these are all clues, but. So these like sideway trails, that's some kind of phaser or filter. You know, it's a uh. hole in the spectrum. It's quieter here. But since they're curving up like that, and it also, you know, I know what that sounds like. And you can see it's a frequency shifter. But once you make that connection between what it looks like and what it sounds like, you, you can you know, use that. Okay, this might be way out of fucking pocket, but is that, could you essentially figure out the shape 
of an automation curve like on the is like is that mm. essentially that would be yeah. the shape like I mean, a shark fin you know like that's what i call it like a shark fin is like a growl usually you yeah. know what i mean like mm -hmm. when i'm drawing in lfos yeah so yeah. you could see the shape by by doing this that's fucking sick. yeah yeah that's so dope so the, this curve like this like ooh, the, the sub is going up and then going mm -hmm. back down here like that and then you can remake it it's like uh it's i need it a little tighter all right it's, it's that's huge amazing visual feedback if you're trying to recreate something at least or just understand how it was automated. Like, oh, the pitch is going down here. Oh, okay, oh, I gotta yeah. like, add that into my articulation to make sure that that. And then I can see here. Oh, actually, I don't have information above like in four or five k here, so I just probably get rid of all that stuff. It's like filter it off, right? That's such a gem. Yeah, I know. that is insane. especially even just with pitch. Like just for us, like a lot of times we're trying to figure out sounds, especially Skrillex sounds. For some reason. All of his sounds are like out of tune, but they sound in tune. Or like pitch drift. He does a lot of pitch stuff too. It's mm. like, oh, it pitches up high, pitches low, yeah. pitches high, then goes low, and it's hard to, to hear it sometimes because they're so quick. Mm -hmm. But being able to see it on something like yeah, that, it. yeah. Like, oh, okay. Hold oh, on. oh, so it actually goes up, then it goes down. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, that's yeah, so yeah. cool. I guess it happens so quickly. By the way, I love that one sound, that little like filtered reese that kind of just happens in the middle of this drop. This I, I I love that. I don't know why. Yeah, it's such a so nice sick. compliment to everything. Everything else is so yeah. gritty, and then you have this like little filter. Yeah, I wanted to make sure that the bass, because there's not a lot of movement here. Like this is just one note, right? It's a Wait, where is it? This one here. And I wanted to have some like sub movement. Just to make it feel a little more wonky and, and, and weird. I love it. Like I hear I'm phasing from a chorus effect, I think, to a frequency shifter inside of. Is it inside of this patcher? It must be. Oh, sorry, it's a flanger. It's not a chorus. My bad. You see, you see the pattern there? Yeah, it's the same pitch too. Yeah, that's the, the flange. So cool. So, oh, okay. This is cool, but it's not like I don't like go about sound design this way necessarily. It's just if you're wondering how something was made, like for example here, this bit crusher effect, like that is very recognizable. That right. kind of pattern. See, the, the, the frequencies are getting closer to each other, and that's being repeated upwards. So it's like, oh, what is on that sound? Like, how did he make that? It's like, oh, fucking looks like a bit crusher. Effect. So bit crushers will always look like that. Essentially, is what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so cool. So uh, yeah, and I'm they have the to little, see, yeah, and then that's copied upwards. Like, it's just two sine waves that are getting closer to each other. That's the tension to get like. Mm, yeah. That's huge, man. That allows you to understand what's actually going yeah, on with uh -huh. the sound. Like, why does a bit crusher sound the way it does? Because it, that's literally, yeah, the sine waves are being modulated towards each other. Interesting. If I take, like, another... <laughs> See? Yeah. Same exact oh, thing. cool. Bit crusher on a bit crusher That's on, a, so cool. on a bit crusher. That was like a Dr. Seuss rhyme. Yeah, the modulation obviously makes it harder to see. Right. But I, I see the I see the trends. In, yeah, the in, pattern exactly. Very cool. So it can help you learn some things and spot things. And that's what I definitely figured out how what, what a chorus was doing. I just had like the pitch going up and down. Like, right. Oh. Yeah, I, f I, f I finally figured out what Sick. chorus was like. Oh, it's just a short delay. Like that's all a chorus is. Yeah. Like oh, like when stuff. But it varies. Yeah, it does. Like, yeah, it does vary. That's so very cool, cool man. Uh, can you go it back varies. to your uh, to your master? Very cool. <laughs> Talk to me about this secret weapon you got on there. It's called the Invisible Limiter G2. Oh, yeah. It's so such a juicy boy. Every high level producer that comes into the studio fucks with Invisible Limiter. So they they were on one and now they're on two. Some of them don't want to go to two. Is they're still two? on the Wait, one. There is a two? This oh, is G2. Yeah, two. yeah, yeah. You're on G2, know, but the, the whatever the yeah, first yeah, one was. Previous. Talk to me about that because I used to use this all the time, mm. and I kind of stopped using it just because I was going more towards stock. We were doing a lot more videos, so I didn't want to put this on and be giving so away project files. the reason that I rely on it is because I like the tone of it. When I slam into it, it's not going to give me that like super noticeable 
you can hear it. Artifacts, yeah, yeah. Distortion. It's really good at hiding the artifacts of compression. I mean, I really wish I could fucking. Is that why they call it invisible? Yep. It's a clean limiter. I've never gotten it to sound good. I that loved it. That or clip shifter. I just love the way Pro L sounds. There's I never a used clip to it. Shifter. But you're right. You can't. You can only push it so much. So you yeah. can push this pretty hard and not really tell is what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. And that's that kind of facilitated my entire process. Yeah, I mean, I don't really fuck much with the settings because it seems to be pretty responsive to the input signal. Like if I slam into this, it's not going to color. I, I noticed that it, it was cleaner than Pro L when I was using it, but I didn't try all of the different algorithms inside of the Pro L. I just really like how clean it sounds. So my entire process for calibrating loudness is basically just pop this on my master, crank the input until I get my LUFS to sit at that desired point. Yeah. And at that point, I know like, oh, it's sounding really crunchy right now. And then I just open up span. I was like, why is it crunchy? Oh, my mm. fucking sub is ridiculous. It's slamming in there. So pull that down, balance it out. Once you flatten it, you'll notice you're going to get much more transparent results already. So really you don't cool. try to put it like, like for us, we have like on our, on our master chain, it's like minus six immediately. Cause I hate turning shit down while I'm producing. So we have it set everything to minus six. Not that, that it actually hits at minus six. We just go minus six dB from whatever volume we're producing at. Mm. So are you saying that you'll just produce at your volume and, and do your levels and stuff, and you're not caring if you're hitting at minus six dB before you're going to your master? You're just turning it on and getting it to, to four luffs and then making your adjustments from there? Is that what you're saying? So you see here the minus threes? That's mm -hmm. like in my template. It's already the case. Oh, yeah, if okay, anybody's so interested in these templates... They're for sale. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Link is in the description. Yeah, plug. Plug it. So what Danny is saying is we keep all of ours at zero, and then in our master chain, the first thing is a utility that pulls everything down minus six so that we can slam it even more. You know what I'm saying? Mm. So it pulls it down first, and then we're adding more with the chain. I see, I see. Right, right, right. So, right. like, theoretically... It depends on your chain. Yeah. yeah. I mean... What's coming in right now is not too crazy. And if I do notice that, like, for example, Maximus is receiving too much input gain, which... Because I love that name. I don't even know what that is. Maximus is, like, the MVP of multiband compression. It's, like, what you... Is this mm, stock? Is OTT, this, like, their is. OTT? Uh, yeah, it's it's basically OTT, and it has a bunch of presets and shit, oh, but man. obviously, it's, it's multiband compressor. Why would you want to use presets? It's silly. How easy it is to manipulate these curves and to spot, like, where to set your threshold and shit like that. So if I play... <laughs> Wait, how do I freeze it again? Oh, I've seen this in tutorials. We're looking at the input signal here, right? The curve that comes in. Yeah. That is essentially like, you know, your dynamics. You can see like how much up and down it goes. If it's, I say, huh, that's too dynamic. I want to tuck my bass in. You can set it around there. Oh, it's the knee. Yeah, yeah it's the exactly. Knee. And then you can like make this go up. So this is your input volume or output volume. If you leave everything like this, right now I'm not doing anything. What's going in is going out. So as soon as I start to pull this down, so here's the zero point, by the way, the, in the middle. Okay. So okay. When it goes above that, you're obviously going to go a little hot. So if you want to control that, those dynamics, you can easily do upwards compression by pulling this to the left. So now it's the volume is being pulled up because it's going this way. And then you can control that really. Like if you want to gate it, like soft gate it, this is super soft gated now. Like, oh, let's let's do it on really the master cool. so we can hear um, more clearly what we're doing. So let's say I'm going to gate the song. Oh, See, wow. Anytime. So for percussion, for compression, for anything really, this is insanely controlled. That's crazy. You can move that around. This is just so flexible. Like you can you can even make this bigger, make it as big as you want. <laughs> is this a newer FL no, function? No, Maximus has been around for a long, long time. So it's like no. So are FL users even using the the shitty Steve Duda OTT? Or are you guys using this? I prefer to use this definitely. Yeah, this I, seems I, cool. I used to use the OTT. I, I would would have it sometimes on my channels but honestly this is way i mean it's a bit more like it's not as fast like if you're trying to just like slap ott turn the depth up and you right. get decent results you could do that or you can just make yourself a preset inside of maximum right. that does the exact same thing really cool whereas uh cpu load i'm not sure obviously when you turn on linear phase which it is obviously on the master always have linear phase on 
because it will fuck with the dynamics of the input signal. When it's an uncompressed signal, it's technically not quite as important because it's already. But if you put not like zero latency on a compressed signal, you're gonna totally fuck with the dynamics of the input of the output. Right. Yeah. It's gonna change it completely because we're, you're messing with the phase. You're you're rotating the phase around the crossover points, and you could kill your uh, transients also potentially. Not necessarily, but it's dangerous so linear phase on the master is helpful it's safer so anyway upwards compression downwards compression you have pre-input gain here you also have some distortion here that you can soft clip i love this thing and then you have mid low you can do it obviously you can do this on oh, each, so you can each of the bands each of them. That's yeah sick. yeah low That's mid really and cool. high and then this is the the amount this is like the wet dry right. for low mid and high not master that's not included in here yeah, uh, people talk about sound goodizer a lot. You know, yeah, yeah. Like, it's like the sausage fattener. <laughs> yeah, it's the sausage fattener <laughs> of FL essentially. Sound goodizer. The sound goodizer presets are right here. A B C D. Oh, cool. So if you just want to use that and actually change them to what you need right. it to be, just go in there and actually like custom to your song because it might be like the the way that you've said it is actually not like the threshold is set too high for the bass is like it's actually right. not compressing the bass or or the bass is getting crazy compressed so you might want to move the threshold up you can do that now just in here and then the 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 actual like knob of sound geyser is this one here that's literally the one you have ever used sound geyser yeah Sick. it was it was a long time ago yeah that was like a big deal i remember ableton everyone seven. was like fuck man it's not ableton seven it's an fl only thing <laughs> no, dude, I swear it was in Ableton. It oh, was a third God. party. Here we go. <laughs> I swear, dude. Sound Goodizer. Do we need to make a bet right now? No, dude. So th when I think of Sound, sound Goodizer, it was with mm -hmm. Camel Fat, Camel Crusher. That's uh, the six and a half hours later. Dead these, Mouse. These we guys already, we have here. to bring this back Oh, again. yeah, dude. You were wrong. It was so cool being able to learn all this stuff as far as uh, using visual tools to help you separate your mix. And I thought you did a beautiful job of explaining. Essentially, the question was, is like, hey, when I listen to your mixes, everything sounds so separated. Like, I could specifically tell that. And obviously, going over a lot with the mid-side, uh, with span and stuff like that was just so, so helpful for me as a producer and hopefully to everybody else. So I just want to thank you for, like, spending time with us and, and showing us some cool tools and stuff like that. I mean, we, mix analysis professor. with treat. Analytics. Yes. With the trick. Yes. No, it's, he's from Brussels. He's automatically smarter than us. It's <laughs> Dutch. No, sorry, not well. I'm sorry. I'm not Dutch. I'm I'm Belgian. <laughs> very very intelligent people. You know what I mean? All good at music. Not everybody's good at music. All of them are good at music out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, dude. dude. I've seen it. Uh, people from Guadalajara, yeah. terrible at music. <laughs> We will see you guys in the next one. Make sure you subscribe, like the video, comment your favorite tip of the day. Timestamp that shit. Timestamp it, yeah. I want to know. Yeah, exactly. And go go to his website. Just go look at it. Just look at it. Just look at Just it. Just take a look. Just take a look. Just a peek. Just a little peek. Just, just a, a little peek. like, oh, hey, the window's open. Let me just see what's going on Get in there. some free oh, stuff. It's like and treat. try to leave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks Thank for so watching. Much.